having an absolutely great day. Welcome to our online service here at the Church at the Beach. You know, we're going through the book of Mark and we're going to go through this and together. But if you're if someone who has not been to our church, we urge you, come on, each service stands alone or each sermon stands alone. And then, of course, it's part of the bigger picture of the gospel as Mark as well. Last week, we had the coronation of the King, Jesus Christ. He has entered his ministry here on earth. And then this week, we're going to go into Jesus being in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan, and then also him calling a few of his apostles. But before we get to the actual sermon and the music, I would ask you to take a listen to Sister Pam and Sister Brenda. I think Brother Don might be on here as well, because we would like for you to join us for our barbecue cookout this coming Saturday evening, or afternoon really, at 4 p.m. God bless, and I'll see you on the back side. <laughs> hey, Brenda, guess what? On Friday, May the 14th, I'm getting a day off. What? Yeah. Don't you know why? Well, no. Because the guys are going to be cooking all day. Barbecue for the church on the next day. And I get the house all to myself. No end. Huh. May 15th, folks, we're having a barbecue and a singing. The singing starts from 4 to 5, and then we eat until we run out of food. And I don't know anything else to say. But I, but I, won't, but I won't be cooking. No. Oh. No. No. Uh -huh. That's true. You should not be cooking. This don't stand for a good cook, does it? <laughs> huh? No. No.
You know, I encourage all of you to celebrate people. We celebrate events a lot, right? You win a game, you lose a game, you're happy, you're sad. Celebrate people. Celebrate your spouse. Today we're celebrating mothers, and we're doing it as a whole, in the, as a church. And, and maybe your mother's no longer with us, and I'm so sorry. That makes it very tough, I'm sure. But folks, I got to tell you, celebrate the person, not just the event. As we get started today, God is good. Y'all were not as good as the first group. That was, I mean, that wasn't bad. Bob yelled, but, uh, but that wasn't as good as the first group. And about the same number of people. So we can do a little better. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. Oftentimes more during the bad times because that's when we realize we need God, right? And we turn to him and say, God, you got to take it all because I can't handle it. As I've already asked you, you have your, your books or your Bibles open or they're turned on to Mark in chapter 1. So I have a, a, a little song that I want you to listen to, just a few seconds of. But I, I want to touch on this because last week we covered the first, what was it, maybe 11 verses in, in the book of Mark. And I want this to drive home the point of what happened because, well, let's just play it. You ready, Brother Jerry? good okay what it make you think of graduation absolutely so that made you think of graduation and I do want you to know that next Sunday Lord willing we will be celebrating all the high school and college graduates here at the church at the beach so if there's any chance that someone is here that we don't know about let me or brother John or brother Barry know we will write it down and get the information we think we got everybody but if we don't we don't want to exclude anyone so we will have that going on next week as well but I played that song. It was written, I don't know, 1901, 1902 by a guy. But it was written in response to one of Shakespeare's dramas, Othello. And it's about going off to battle, and it's pride and, what's it, pomp and circumstance and the glories of war. That would be the line that Shakespeare wrote. I took some literature courses, and some of it even classical. I got to admit, I read the cliff notes, if I read anything at all. I was pretty good at listening in class, and the teachers wanted us to be reading Shakespeare, and I wanted to be reading John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, and things like that. So with that being said, I don't know all that much about it, but I know that when I hear that song, I think of graduation. And I needed to remember, to, of course, to announce that we were going to have that next week. But with that, I don't want to mislead anybody. Last week, we talked about Psalm chapter, or the second Psalm. We talked about Malachi chapter 3, just a little bit. And it was all about Jesus coming into this world, into his ministry, and John the Baptist being his predecessor, or his messenger, if you will. Now, there would have been some Jewish believers in the Roman church, but what I want you to hang with me here is that most of those believers in the church in Rome that Mark was writing to, most of them were Gentiles just like us. So it would be silly of us to think that when they heard the Psalms or when they heard Isaiah or when they heard Malachi, they wouldn't have really had that much of an idea about this God and this Messiah that was supposed to come and rule over the world. But what they would have heard and understood, just like when you heard that song and understood, is that all of this means a king is here. He has paved the way. There has been a group of people that have made sure that the road is straight and it's safe and secure. There won't be any bandits or pirates coming and, and, and doing something bad to him on his path. That's what John the Baptist did, and that's what those Gentile believers understood when Mark wrote from the Old Testament. And then, boom, Jesus is here. It's this unreal moment where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all right there. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. He comes out, and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes down. Jesus, water coming off of him. God the Father from the cloud states, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And wow, what a moment that would have been. But now we're going to go on 
as I guess we could say, to a little bit rest of the story. You know, if we were going to use churchy terms, and I know that most of you aren't really that interested in this, and really you probably shouldn't be, but I want you to hear terms every once in a while just so that you got them in the bag. And so when we talk about Jesus being a king, that is part of a study of Christology or Christology. And the reason that I even bring that up is that I want you to know is the words you hear here on Sunday mornings, the things that you are taught in a Bible teaching and a Bible believing as opposed to a, um, just a feel-good situation is this. For thousands of years, people have studied and refined and studied some more in order to get you the information that you receive. So that's part of what we've understood over thousands of years from the Bible about Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The next thing that I want you to know is simply this. Jesus relates to you and me. I'm going to be honest with you about myself. Do, and I want, I want you to be honest with yourself. Do you, any of you usually pray in order for Jesus to fix things? Man, that's me. I've messed it up. You're God, you fix it. I believe in you. You're sovereign. You control everything. Make it happen, God. But I want to stress you, to you today that not only should we and can we pray to God through faith in Jesus Christ, can we get his ear because he can fix things. But I've also learned to find great solace in the fact that he can relate to us. And as we're going into today's passage, that's the main thing that maybe you should take away from this is that Jesus relates to you and me. He has felt it. He has been hungry he has been angry at people. He has been betrayed. Things haven't gone right in his life. And so when you go to him in prayer and you're down on your knees and the tears are falling from your eyes and you don't understand because you did the best you could and it still doesn't turn out right for you, he's right there listening and he understands exactly where you are. And he's going to love you through it no matter how bad this world has done you. He relates to us. Not only can he fix it, but he can relate to it. There are a couple things in the background that you need to know. One is, I just don't want you to assume I had a great text message last Sunday. I have a couple questions about the sermon. Not like anything was wrong, just like, I want a little more information about that. Boom, 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 hit you up. I'll get it right back to you. Email me, call me, text me, whatever. I love that stuff. But I want to make sure that you know, this is going to make it seem like John the Baptist absolutely got arrested and then boom, then Jesus starts his ministry. If we were summarizing, that would be fair to say. But there was an overlap of a couple of months, probably at least, from the time that John the Baptist gets arrested and the time that, John, uh, that Jesus starts his ministry in Galilee. How do we know that? We know that from the Gospel of John. I think it's chapter 2, but I didn't look it up like I probably should have. And Jesus goes in early in his ministry. He gets to Jerusalem, and he's ticked off, just like you've been ticked off at people before. He didn't sin, but he cleansed the temple. Y'all aren't acting right. I don't like it. You better change your ways. So that would have happened. But now here we are. Mark has bypassed that in his gospel account, and he's going up into Galilee. My wife's not in here today, but last week, my wife is from a little community named Calvert City. I'm from a big community of about 4,500 people. Calvert City only has about 3,800. And we are much more refined in Benton. Most all of us can read and write. For almost 100 years, we're about to celebrate our 100-year anniversary of having running water in Benton. As long as you don't get to Soldier Creek. Once you get past Soldier Creek, you got to build a well, dig a well. But she was a little offended that I was talking bad about Calvert City. So, Kara, I'm sorry. Not really. I'm proud of Benton. But I want us to understand this, not only the overlapping, but also this idea of the kingdom of God. Mark and Luke would have called it the kingdom of God. In your Bible, when you're reading, Matthew would have called it the kingdom of heaven. Why? If it's the same thing, what are we, why? Because Matthew, being a devout Jew, would have been much more hesitant to use the word or the name of Yahweh or God in his writing. So he just refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are three different aspects of the kingdom that I want you to know about. Different parts of Scripture, different 
aspects of the kingdom of heaven. But most all the time when we're talking, it's going to be this first one, the realm of salvation now. So in essence, here's what's happened when we get to about verse 14 in today. It's like Jesus has come onto the scene and says, the king has been coronated by God the Father and the kingdom is here. And guess what? If you are a child of God, you are living in the kingdom of God today. He is working differently inside of you than he is anybody else. Oh, man, the poor people that haven't put their faith in Jesus. How about them, Jay? Here's what I'm telling you. They have an opportunity. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, then today is the day Christ will forgive you. He loves you. He does desire for you to repent and believe. But at the same time, if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to know this. You are a child of God. You are special. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you so that you could be saved from your sin. That is awesome stuff. When you say a prayer, it is different than the person that is a Muslim who says a prayer. Your prayers are heard by God through your faith in Jesus Christ, where the person that is the Buddhist or the Zaoist or something of the the Hindu doesn't have the same opportunity to pray to the creator of the universe as Christians have the opportunity to pray. It is this realm of salvation in which all of God's people are operating and he is the one controlling the operation. Most of the time, that's the realm of salvation. That is the kingdom of God. But sometimes it talks to and talks about the 1,000-year reign on earth of Jesus the Christ. Now, we have different opinions and different thoughts on how the book of Revelation goes. And I don't think that anybody has it 100% right. But I will go this far. If anyone uses the same methods of studying the book of Revelation that you use on the entire rest of the body, the other 65 books of the Bible, then you are going to come to this understanding that there will be a 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. And he is going to rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is going to make everything that is right wrong. Anytime there is something done wrong, he is going to correct it immediately. And everybody is going to tighten up. Right here we go. You're the king and we're following you. So in sometimes in the Bible, that is the kingdom of God. But then there's also this eternal kingdom of God. The celestial city. This beautiful place where you'll never cry, you'll never hurt, you'll never want anything. There won't even be a sun because we'll have the sun in that eternal kingdom of God. So in order to understand these verses, you needed to understand that about John the Baptist and Jesus's Ministries overlapping just a little bit, and then you also needed to understand what the kingdom of God even is. You know, <clears throat> some of you that have been here for a while, you might remember a guy named Larry Malone. We had men's group one night and men's Bible study, and we all get into the conference room. There's maybe 20 of us. Larry drops his Bible down and says, What is the kingdom of God? Mike, you might have been in there. I don't know, Jonah, maybe you too. And so we kind of looked around like, Then we started saying all kinds of dumb stuff, you know, like, like, no, that's not right. But we all were just trying to answer Larry's question. Folks, that's important that we understand what the kingdom of God is. If you're a follower of Christ right now, you have the proper king. And if you don't have the proper king, then you've got a problem. And you need to pledge your allegiance to the sovereign ruler of the universe. Verses 12 and 13. How great is our God. Every Sunday morning we say, God is good. Not now, Bob. (laughs) Bob, a little quick on the trigger. Let's make sure he's not on the security team. The, uh, jeez. The, uh, no, I'm sorry, Bob. The, uh, so, so we say God is good all the time. And he is good. He loves you. He forgives you. He's merciful. He's gracious. All of those things. He's good. And we say it that way every Sunday because I want you to know that God is good because his goodness directly, without a doubt, impacts you and you and you and everyone here. He's good. But God is great. He is sovereign, total control of everything. He is omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipotent, he is all-powerful. 
He's omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. That is how great, wow, our God is. Verses 12 and 13. Immediately or straight away, if you have the King James Version, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, drove him into the wilderness. Drove him, sent him, impelled him. Not just, no, emphatically put him into the wilderness. But he didn't, he didn't resist that. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. That's a full second part of the compound sentence is what we call it in English. The angels came and ministered to him at the very end. Jesus, in his greatness, relates to you and me. Here we have this situation with Jesus, folks, where he has had this unreal situation. He has left heaven to fulfill the will of the Father, and he has lived about 30 years, and now he knows it's time to start his ministry, and his second cousin, potentially third cousin, somewhere related, baptizes him in the river. And he comes up, and we have this moment where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Spirit are all seen together right here on the earth, and this had to be this unreal greatest moment ever in the humanity of Jesus. But he's just like you and me. Because, see, he came to this earth to relate in all of our humanity and in all of his humanity just like us. So what happens? This greatest moment ever, and then to the wilderness you go, big boy. You are going to relate to these sinful people. You are going to understand what they go through. When they pray to you, they're not even going to have to always ask for you to fix it. Sometimes it's going to be just enough because you know Jesus, fully God and fully man, understands it. Whatever you're going through. Drives to the wilderness. No humans were there. He was just being beat up by the wild beast. Think about that, an arid, dry region. Nothing to eat. After just a few days, your body would just be weak. Luke and Matthew both give us over 10 verses each about what happened. I could compare this to Moses in Exodus 24, I think it is. I could compare this to um, maybe Elijah in 1 Kings 19. But I don't want to do that with you because I don't think that's a great picture of what, what Mark's looking for here. When you read about Jesus in the wilderness, this is where I think your mind should go. Not to make you feel bad about you, but this is, this is the, 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 hopefully the result is that you feel not so necessarily bad about yourself, but great about him. Is that Adam, man, the very first one, he is put into the Garden of Eden. Everything is beautiful. Everything is luscious. Everything is provided. He has nothing to worry about. He doesn't need anything. All he has to do is just don't eat of one tree. And guys, we can blame it on the women if we want to. And women, you probably deserve the blame. But men, we've got to step up and say that we ate too. And in a perfect situation... Man couldn't do it, okay, in the Garden of Eden. But you put Jesus, fully man, in a wilderness with nothing to eat, Satan tempting him, feed yourself, jump off the cliff and let the angels fall, you know, catch you. All of these things, nothing to eat, and Jesus never sins. He does exactly what the God the Father has called him and led him to do. So even though he can relate unbelievably to us, he's beyond our comprehension with the God-man, Jesus Christ. Motivation now for verse 14 and 15. When it's time to get to work, Jesus got to work. And as Christians, when it's time for us to get to work, we got to get to work. Now, after John was put in prison, so you have some background on that, Jesus came to Galilee. Remember, nothing good comes from Galilee, so they thought. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. 
You understand. And saying the time, not chronologically the time. I know you don't care anything about studying the Greek. It's not talking about boom, 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 boom the time. It's talking about a specific major event in history that was predestined to happen. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. I'm the king. Here's my kingdom. Follow me and I'll rule over you. So the question is for you today, do you want Jesus to be ruling over you in his kingdom or do you want Satan to be ruling over you in his? One is going to end up pretty good for you and the other one's not. Choose wisely. Repent and believe. Turn to God with everything you got and believe in the good news of Jesus. It's not just the good news, but like we listened to last week, it's the best news ever. It's how Jesus brings human beings into right relationship with God. I would like for you to know at this point, and I say this passionately, but it's important that you understand as we talk about Jesus Christ. If we were going to use churchy words, we would say soteriology. We would talk about the study of salvation. See, don't y'all just think I'm so smart and like so educated now that I'm using words y'all don't hear very often. Christ meets people where they are. But as we talk about this, I want you to know that you are saved by God, from God, and for God. You cannot boast. It's nothing that you have done. Said another way, you could listen to it and think of it like this. You are saved by God's grace alone. God's grace alone. By faith alone alone. In Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, for God's glory alone. You weren't saved for you. You were saved because God was going to create this entire universe. There were going to be human beings as the prize creation. He knew that we would rebel. And God said to show every animal, the entire earth, all of the plants, every bit of the water, every human being that has ever lived, even though they are rebellious, even though they don't love me, even though they're going to spit on me and slap me around, and they are going to reject me as their king, for my glory, I'm going to save some of them. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you better be shouting glory, because that means he's one of them, you're one of them that he's chosen to save. Some of you, that's new for you to hear. Some of you think that you're saved because you Saved yourself by your own thoughts, words, merits. That's not what the Bible teaches. The king does the saving. Verses 16 through 20. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That's not a new term to Jesus as I grew up thinking it was. I thought, oh, that's cool. He called them fishers of men and they were fishermen. No, the philosophers of that time and even the Greek philosophers before then, they already used that phrase for their followers and their thinking. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Verse 19, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. From studying all this, it seems Andrew and Peter knew, well, they did know John the Baptist, but when he was arrested, they went back to fishing. Peter's going to do that again when things get tough for Jesus. He goes back to fishing. And sometimes in life, that's going to happen. We're going to be in active service to God, and we're going to be full throttle. And then some things are going to happen. We're going to have a little time of rest, and we got to get back to just doing what we do. And then Jesus calls on us again right where we are, and we have to step up, and we have to get to work. But folks, people don't always do. You, I, don't always do what Christ, what God has instructed us to do. But Jesus calls men right where they really are. See, if we're not careful, as I study, as I pray, as I dig into this stuff, and I learn more and more, we can think that we really know a lot about the Bible. We can think that we're pretty special. 
We can think, now I'm enlightened and educated. Everyone look and stare and listen to me. Jesus didn't like those people. And I don't either. Because you know where Jesus meets you? Right where you are. He meets you when you're working your job day in, day out. He meets you when your kids don't act right. He meets you when your boss isn't acting right. He meets you when your spouse is being an idiot. That's where Jesus meets you. So folks, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. And so here we have this situation with Andrew, with Peter, with James, with John. We learned a couple of weeks ago that the religious elites thought that they were idiots. He met them right where they were. But why would Jesus call these fishermen? Fair question. Here are some qualities of fishermen. They're tough. They work together. They're patient. They have energy. They have stamina. They're not quitters. Usually, even though they might a little bit while they're working, they're not complainers. Folks, as a pastor, I have to tell you, that sounds good to me. Let's get a lot of people together at the church at the beach that are fishermen and have all those qualities right there to get the job done, to get this beach going for Jesus Christ. So how does all of this transform your life. Is anybody here, you can raise your hand, watch the Chosen series. Y'all have? Deb, you have? So it's not the Bible. It doesn't replace Scripture. But I've watched it a few times, and I think you should watch it. All right? Remember, it is not the Bible. It, there's some drama, dramatization involved. But it, it gives good ideas, and it takes you through a very human side of Jesus. So there's some things kind of added in and made up in there. But there are two lines that I've already heard that I really like. And let me clarify, you have a responsibility to repent and believe when the Holy Spirit reaches into your heart and changes it and you are born again. You as a person must repent and believe. That has to be your response. But at this point, these guys didn't know that they were becoming apostles. At this point, these, people, these guys were just like you and me. And one of the apostles steps up. When they're being questioned, why are you following this guy, Jesus? He's crazy. He's a radical. Why are you doing this? He said, no, no, we did not choose him. He chose us. And some of you don't like that when the preacher says that he chose you. But I have to tell you, I'm not smart enough, I'm not enlightened enough, I'm not cool enough, I'm not brilliant enough to ever, as a sinful man, knowing who I am, as a person, I never on my own could have possibly ever decided to forsake all my sin and live totally according to the ways of God, or at least strive to do it. I never could have done that. He had to do the changing. He had to choose me. I love that line. And then there's another line. If we're going to have a question and answer, this is Jesus talking to the apostles. He would do something, they'd have a thousand questions. If we're going to have a question and answer session every time we do something, this is going to be a very annoying journey. <laughs> you can feel that way in your work sometimes, right? Really, it's just going to be the color red. There doesn't have to be a thousand questions, right? Things just happen. But it's going to be a very annoying journey. So I think a question for you might be this morning, if you've been a Christian your whole life or you're not a Christian, how do you know if you're chosen? Much simpler than you think. Do you have faith? Do you have faith? If you trust in Jesus, then you are chosen. And I want you to know that you should feel really, really good about that. Not because of anything that you have done. No, no, no. No man can boast. You should feel really, really good about that because the God of the universe chose you for his glory. Yes. Chose you for eternity in heaven, yes. even though you didn't deserve it. So if you are a Christian and you have faith, we've established that you're chosen. I really think that maybe even though a lot of people don't hear that, it's Inarguable. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were chosen. 
They drop the nets and they follow Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, you have some ability to reject him, though, with your life's work. So I've got to ask you, how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond like your pastor did for about 20 years in between the time I knew I was called to preach and the time that I dropped my nets and said, let's go. Let's get to work. Are you going to be like these guys? Are you going to be like Jesus was when it was time for him to get into ministry? He went out there and he went to the wilderness and he got to ministry. Only you can answer. Choose wisely. Well, thanks again for joining us here for our online service at the Church of the Beach. Uh, as we continue to go through the book, book of Mark, I, I do want to ask you, have you ever put your faith in Jesus, really repented and believed? You know, God calls on us to trust Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for our forgiveness of sin. Because that's what separates us from God, is our sin. If you'll put your faith in Jesus' work and live your life totally for God, then God's going to save you. And it'll be the best life you could ever live. If you have not made that decision, but you are making that decision today, please call me or email me. My contact information is at the bottom of the screen. I also want to remind you that this Saturday night, 4 p.m., we're going to have some music. We're going to have a barbecue here on the church campus. And we're just going to have a good time of fellowship, hanging out with each other and loving on each other, getting ready for next Sunday morning when we meet together again to meet with God here at the Church at the Beach. God bless you, and as always, we love you, and God does too. Lord.